Okay, welcome. Hello, this is Ethics and my name is Mark Thorsby. In this video series, we're taking a look at a number of different ethical theories. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morality, and in particular, the second treatise, or the second essay of that text. Uh, the title of that text is Guilt, Bad Conscience, and related, related Matters. And we're going to see that what Nietzsche offers here is he offers a fuller argument regarding his discussion of the origin of our moral concepts. Um, you'll recall that in the first treatise, Nietzsche distinguished between uh, two sets of moral concepts. On the one hand, you have good versus evil, and on the other hand, you have good versus bad. This is the distinction between master and slave morality. And we're going to see Nietzsche really be, develop even further his argument related to that. Uh, but we're going to see really the sort of gist of it is in the second essay, he, he identifies that the beginning of our moral concepts actually doesn't begin with morality at all, but rather it begins with uh, the relationship that human beings have in terms of um, having debts and being indebted to each other and making um, deals with each other and covenants with each other, and also the psychology, human psychology. And ultimately we'll see that Nietzsche thinks that out of a, the creditor-debtor debtor relationship, which ultimately develops... Um, because of the instincts and the, the psychology of human beings, it ultimately develops into the feelings of guilt um, and bad conscience. And this is going to be, he thinks, is the seed that really begins to develop the difference between uh, the transition, if you will, from master morality to slave morality. Um, so this is the second essay. What I want to do here is you'll see that at the top of each of these slides, I have a number or most of the slides, and that's the number of the sections. So all of these quotes come from these sections. So for instance, this first quote comes from section one of the second essay. So what you can do is you can follow along, if you will, uh, with the text. Um, and what I've done here is, of course, I can't cover everything in the text. So I've pulled what I thought are really the meaty bits here that are central to the argument. Uh, and it's also difficult because, because of the Nietzsche's writing style in terms of his using aphorisms, which makes it a little bit more difficult. So anyway, let's start off with this quote that I pulled for us to take a look at, where Nietzsche says, quote, To breed an animal with the right to make promises, is not this the paradoxical task that nature has set itself in the case of man? So there, Nietzsche's offering the idea that human beings make promises, um, and we have, right, we have the right of making promises, but what does that mean exactly? Um, he ultimately thinks this is paradoxical in nature, because ultimately... Um, what would be most natural is for human beings to pursue their interest wherever they recognize those interests, whether or not they've made promises or not. But when you make a promise, you're setting yourself up to a commitment in the future when you are not potentially aware of what the conditions for meeting that promise might actually be. So there's something paradoxical here, at least if you compare, imagine human beings in a purely naturalistic sense versus human beings in a civilized sense. How does this take place, right? And here he suggests that the opposing force to making promises is forgetfulness. So the opposite of making a promise is to forget. Forgetfulness, though, is not understood as simply a form of passivity, as, as just not doing something, but rather it's understood as an activity of the positive faculty of repression. So you can see here, for Nietzsche, there's a psychological idea of repression here that there's certain things that we repress out of our consciousness but which are informing our consciousness of things. And forgetfulness is a type of activity of repressing that which you don't want to think about, right? So the purpose of the act of forgetting, if you will, is to make room for the, quote, the more nobler functions and the functionaries, the regulation, foresight, and premeditation. And here there's an interesting relationship between Nietzsche and Freud that you may be interested in following up in your own research. For instance, in one of the early conferences, between Freud and the other psychoanalyst of, of I think, of Germany, or at least the European Conference of Psychoanalysts, um, there's a discussion about to what degree is Freud's work indebted to Nietzsche. And we'll see that Nietzsche, even though he, there's not a robust science of psychology in the way we have it today when Nietzsche's writing, Nietzsche recognizes, or at least he anticipates, many of the insights that psychologists have, um, have offered um, within the last 150 years or so, right? So, and, and so repression being one of those, Freud talks about it, so there's an interesting relationship there worth following up on.
but without forgetfulness, if you couldn't have forgetfulness, Nietzsche says then you can't have happiness, um, because you're always, you can't forget the, about the horrible things that have happened to you, so you can't be happy, right? You couldn't have pride in yourself because your mistakes would always be present. In fact, you couldn't even live in the present. Um, and of course, Nietzsche is relating this here to the notion of the Ubermensch, but also I think in our, con in our congenial sense, in which we live our lives in the common everyday sense, right? Forgetfulness is actually pretty important for us. Um, <clears throat> so what this means, therefore, is that forgetfulness is number one, it's a psychic force for man. And when I say man, Nietzsche uses the term man, but humankind. I don't like this, the sort of gendered language Nietzsche uses, but I'm using it in the videos because that's what he says. Um, one of the things we see too is that Nietzsche seems to marvel, I think, at the way in which forgetfulness has it bred itself into memory. He says, quote, man himself must first of all have become calculable, regular, necessary, even in his own image of himself, if, is, if he is able to stand security for his own future, which is one, which is what one who promises does. So the notion here is that this forgetfulness seems to have enabled human beings to regulate themselves um, to some degree. So, let's see here. So, this brings us to the second section, which is on the origin of responsibility. Um, and, uh, and so this sort of is a moral concept, right? And we've talked about it at length, um, especially when we're looking at uh, the work of Immanuel Kant. What we could say here is that number one, as a preparatory task to making promise, to making promise makers, one has to first make human beings regular and uniform, right? They have to be calculable, rational creatures. Notice that in our previous videos, we saw how Kant emphasize that human beings must be rational agents, right? Calculable. And number two, the final consequence of the origin of responsibility is the creation of quote unquote the sovereign individual. So at the end of this long process, historically for Nietzsche, we arrive somehow through the psychological process with what we might call the sovereign individual. Who is that? Well, quote, in short, the man who has his own independent protracted will and the right to make promises and in him a proud consciousness, quivering in every muscle of what has at length been achieved and become flesh in him. Um, a consciousness of his own power and freedom, a sensation of mankind come to completion, right? And so what we have here is the dominating instinct of the sovereign individual. And what is this dominating instinct? It is con the conscience, the conscience. Now notice here, what is a conscience? That's that feeling you get that you've done something wrong or right. You've done something bad. So a conscience is this feeling. Notice that. Many times, for instance, I think that, ne that Kant downplays the way in which con the, the conscience is a feeling. Um, and in, insofar as it is a feeling, it re it's an instinctual thing. Um, and so Nietzsche, I think, explores in a really interesting way the sort of psychological dimension of the goodwill and the consciousness, or the bad will and the bad conscience, right? So the conscience has its own long and varied origin and its own method, and there's the, it has its own methodology for its development, right? Nietzsche says, one can well believe that the answers and methods for solving the primeval problem were not precisely gentle, right? Man could never do without blood, torture, and sacrifice when he felt the need to create a memory for himself. The most dreadful sacrifices and pledges, the most repulsive mutilations, all of this has its origin in the instinct that realized that pain is the most powerful aid to mnemonics. So there needs you suggesting, listen, what is the actual sort of practical way in which the, the memory can be enforced, right? Because you can't keep a promise if you don't have memory, but how can you enforce memory um, onto the psychological instincts, right? that ultimately result in this sovereign individual? Well, pain. That's the answer, he says, is essentially that has been what the history of human beings reveals, is we torture each other, we force each other, we punish each other, we disembowel each other. We do all kinds of horrible things, right, in order ultimately to develop, which he thinks ultimately um, builds up to develop this notion of the conscience. And ultimately this is the process of the moralization of the human animal. And what Nietzsche observes is that, well, number one, the worst man's memory has been, the most fearful has been the appearance of his customs. The worst man's memory has been the more fearful are the customs. So the notion there is that 
when the memory is not superimposed, if you will, onto the instinctual drive, the repression and all this of the human being, then what we see is cultures where the customs are quite barbaric, quite violent. Right, number two is that the severity of the penal code and punishment provides actually, it allows us a measure for ascertaining the degree of effort that's needed to overcome this forgetfulness. So we can actually take a look at the penal code and the history of the prison in the penal code and we can begin to recognize the, the degree of which this forgetfulness um, had to be overcome in terms of the memory, right? So, and notice here, this is sort of Nietzsche's thing, is that without forgetfulness, we lose the ability to be happy. And he's going to carry this forward and say that this means that when we look at the history of all of these cruel punishments, what we see is actually uh, this very scary, um, what would you say? Uh, what we see is, what, what he says is that in times past when people were engaged in really violent customs, blood customs, right? They were more cheerful, right? Because they were more forgetful, right? But that's the reason there was these customs ultimately, or that's what their effect was ultimately to develop in human beings a memory, right? Nietzsche says this, right? He says, consider the old German punishments, for example, stoning, breaking on the wheel, piercing with stakes, tearing apart or trampling by horses, boiling of the criminal in oil and wine, the popular flaying alive, cutting straps, cutting flesh from the chest, and also the practice of smearing the wrong tear with honey and leaving him um, in the blazing sun for the flies. With the aid of such images and procedures, one finally remembers five or six I will nots, in regard to which one had given one's promise so as to participate in the advantages of society. And it was indeed with this kind of aid in memory that one was at last came to reason. So Nietzsche's view here is that ultimately, um, through violence essentially, and the really horrible history of torture and all of these things, what happens is man ultimately develops into this rational animal. Um, and so this means that this is starkly opposed to Kant's view that we are rational from the get-go and that's where we derive our moral customs from. Nietzsche seems to be suggesting that no, our moral customs are already embedded into us to the point at which we can become rational and reasonable. So this asks the question is, okay, what about the, the origin of the bad conscience? What about guilt? Well, Nietzsche points out that in German, the moral concept of guilt, Schuld, has its philological origin in the concept of debt, Schulden. So here Nietzsche, remember he's a philologist, so he's tracing word history in order to sort of develop this genealogy. He notices the very word for guilt comes from the same word or comes has shares the, uh, the same history as the word debt right so this ultimately suggests to him that perhaps the moral uh, the moral concepts of guilt and duty actually have their derivative in the notion of debt and credit right the person who makes contracts according to their own interest right he says quote the idea now so obvious apparently so natural, even unavoidable, that has to serve as the explanation of how the sense of justice ever appeared on earth is in fact an extremely late and subtle form of human judgment and inference. Because in other words, the idea of having guilt or a sense of justice is not natural, but it's socially constructed over time. Right? That is, promises have to be made. I mean, the, maybe I should put it this way, the capacity to make promises has to be made. He says, we shall find a great deal of severity, cruelty, and pain to inspire trust in his promise to repay, to provide a guarantee of the seriousness and the sanctity of his promise, and to impress repayment as a duty, an obligation upon one's own conscience. The debtor made a contract with the creditor that pledged that if he should fail to repay, he would substitute something else that he possessed, his body, his wife, his freedom, or even his life. Right, so Nietzsche, right, we should ignore this no, the, this right, total chauvinism here, but um, but here he right Nietzsche saying, listen, uh, it looks like the moral concepts begin with in a history that's that's amoral. It's really uh, a history about the exchange of goods where you need things, but in order to make the exchange, you have to promise something up, right? And what you promise is something that's of your own, right? And this is, and he thinks that it's this relationship which is ultimately impressed through this process of memory making, mnemonics here, 
which ultimately is at the, is, if you will, it's the mechanical process by which our moral concepts have evolved. Now, in ancient Egypt, he notes, a debtor could not even escape their creditor in the afterlife, right? So if you didn't pay your debts, well, when you die, you're still going to pay, well, just forever, right? So notice that, right? He says, historically, that's actually relevant, right? Because what it seems to show us, that is, as well as many other examples, is that the origin of guilt reveals a logic of compensation. So recompense included, so to get compensation or recompense included the pleasure of the creditor being allowed to vent their freedom of will over another. And this is what Nietzsche calls the right of the master. So, and think here about master morality. So, in a sort of naturalistic sense, then the the so the compensation for people who didn't pay for it is included the pleasure of the creditor being allowed to vent their will over another. Notice here this fundamental concept of Nietzsche's, this concept of the will to power. So what this seems to entail is that the moral conceptual world of guilt, conscience, and duty have their origin in the sphere of legal obligations. And he says here, Kant smells of cruelty, right? Because for Kant, the, so the recognition of duty in, uh, by the goodwill is at the very beginning of the groundwork to the metaphysics world, at the very the head of his moral philosophy. And here, if what Nietzsche is saying is right, Kant's whole notion of the goodwill actually has its, its origins in torture and cruelty. And that means, okay, well, how can suffering exactly balance a debt? Well, for Nietzsche, it's pleasure. In other words, he thinks the pleasure of making others suffer. And to be clear, I don't think Nietzsche is suggesting here that we need to start really enjoying ourselves when we, when we hurt other, make other people suffer, but he's pointing out the history of our moral origin, right? Um, and revenge is not a motivation though, he doesn't think, he thinks pleasure is the motivation, not revenge, right? He thinks revenge is, um, is actually a way to, to focus on revenge is to misunderstand human psychology here because revenge um, seems to be, he says, veil the whole problem in darkness, right? Um, because you have to, and this is, is related to the way in which he analyzes psychology, right? Because revenge ultimately is a concept that's related in the notion of justice and, and right, trying to get back at someone and so on and so forth. And he wants to focus on a descriptive origin of these concepts. So he gives these examples of these festivals of cruelty, right? He says, it's not been long since princely weddings and public festivals or more magnificent kind were unthinkable without executions, torturing, or perhaps an auto de fe, and no noble household was out creatures upon whom one could heedlessly vent one's malice and cruel jokes. So right here he's saying, listen, you go back into history and what you see is that People loved and enjoyed watching other people suffer uh, as, mu as much as we, and that wasn't really that long ago, actually, right? It wasn't that long ago, for instance, in the United States when there was public executions, really. Um, and before that, if you go to Europe, there was, not a, there was horrific public executions, right? So he says to see others suffer does one good in this, it does one good in terms of pleasure psychologically to make others suffer even more this is a hard saying but an ancient mighty human all too human principle without cruelty there's no festival so Nietzsche has a very dark view I think of human nature um, and he says it's it's hard to admit this but he thinks that this is a, a, something that's true about human beings and the way human beings organize themselves what Nietzsche is not arguing is that we should be more cruel I think and but that cruelty is a part of the origin story of morality for Nietzsche, a world of cruelty is actually a more cheerful world, right? Because the darkening of the sky above mankind, he says, is deepened in step with the increased in man's feeling of shame at man. So he thinks that as human beings have turned these instincts inward, um, we'll see, um, and basically gained them a moral memory for themselves, that ultimately, the in, in, and as human beings have developed the notion of duty and moral guilt, the, what we see is people are less happy. Um, so it's sort of ironic. You, it's very sort of paradoxical, potentially, conclusion, right? The role of cruelty, though, he says, hasn't died out, right? Uh, there, he says this joy in cruelty does not, does not really have to have died out if pain hurts more today. It simply requires a certain sublim sublimation and subtilization. That is to say, it has to appear translated into the imaginative and um, psychical and adorned with such innocent names that even the tenderest, tenderest um, 
um, I, I'm something, and hypocritical consciousness is not suspicious of them, right? Uh, so you can see here that what Nietzsche is saying here is that it's not so much that we don't enjoy cruelty today, but it's that we have sublimated cruelty. Now, sublimation is the concept that if you desire something, but you can't attain it, you find some other third thing that sort of satisfies the desire or takes the place of that desire. Um, you can think here, for instance, not to be too uh, vulgar, but for instance, if a, think about a person who wants to engage in sexual activity, but they're unable to, and so then they masturbate, that would be an example of sublimation. They've sublimated their drives, their instincts, their desires. And what Nietzsche is suggesting here is that human beings naturally have a, a, a desire to have pleasure towards cruelty, but we've sublimated it somehow, right? We found a way to substitute in and stabilize, if you will, um, the human psyche, right? So, and, and he thinks this ultimately leads to what he calls the invention of free will, right? Free will is an invention. What is free will? It's the spontaneity of human beings and good and evil to choose things that are wrong or right, right? And he thinks that this whole idea of the free will, moral free will, is de devised, quote, above all to furnish a right idea that the interest of the gods in man in human virtue could never be exhausted. Um, so, uh, so it's very sort of interesting. So this brings us to this notion here that at the end of the day, um, our moral concepts come in their initial origin. And, and this is the origin for master morality from a buyer-seller, creditor-debtor relationship. So the origin of the feeling of guilt and, and also of the feeling of personal duty comes ultimately from this sort of legal framework. Uh, for Nietzsche, the source of this economic thinking is quite ancient, right? In fact, it's so ancient that this development, he says, or this ancient thinking of the buyer-seller, debtor-creditor actually may even constitute the origin for thinking itself. Right. But certainly the social moral fabric on his view has its roots in this legal sort of economic exchange. He says, quote, it was rather out of the most rudimentary form of personal legal rights that the budding sense of exchange, contract guilt, right obligation, settlement first transferred itself into the coarsest and most elementary social complexes. So over time, society develops along these lines. Right? And you can say that there's a sort of naive moral canon of justice here where justice for the strong, uh, there's justice for the strong and justice for the weak, weak, right? Justice for the strong means having goodwill among equal parties by means of a settlement of exchange. But justice for the weak means compelling the lesser party to reach a settlement to agree with one's position. Because for Nietzsche, that means that our concept of justice is fairness, the concept that, for instance, John Rawls discusses at great length. This concept for Nietzsche has its first origins in a more naive conception of justice where justice is about having equal economic terms with people who are equal to me and unequal economic terms with people who are unequal to me. Um, and that is, and that's because at the root of it is the notion of the will to power as the psychologically driving force for how human beings engage with each other. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that the community also stands in the same basic relationship of a creditor-debtor relationship to the citizens of that community, right? So in, in the ancient world, to break the law of the community was to invite exile, to get thrown out, right? He says that, for instance, um, the German term elend, uh, which, um, which originally means, uh, I'm sorry, elend, which means misery, originally comes from the root for the word exile. So misery comes from exile. So he's noticing here that um, a sort of moral term, potentially, uh, may have its derivative in a legal term, right? He says even since war itself has provided all the forms of punishment uh, that have been assumed throughout history. And so punishment becomes the means by which communities uh, reinforce or protect and, and, um, uh, and further the creditor debtor relation because if you're a debtor and you don't pay then you need to be punished um, and so that's that sort of naive form of justice which eventually develops into increasingly more complex forms of social existence so as the power of the community increases this means that the transgressions that the individual can do to the community become diminish relatively speaking um, because as a society is more powerful one individual can't actually overthrow the society and that over time, 
this means that punishments can become decreased, right? This is, if you will, the formula of power and punishment, right? So as communal power increases, punishments diminish in their harshness, whereas commun as communal power decreases, punishments become even harsher. This is quite interesting if you wanted to apply this to a moral anthropology and look at different societies that seem to have more cruel forms of punishment than others, right? What you could say is that a society like the United States that has explicit prohibitions against what, what are known as cruel and unusual punishments, right? This seems to indicate that you have a high degree of communal or social power in the most formal sense, and certainly that follows given the uh, formal institutions for the United States. So, and no doubt that same analysis would apply to pretty much many, many places in the, the industrialized world. Um, so, he's, he also adds this quote, the justice which began with everything is dischargeable, everything must be discharged, ends by winking and letting those incapable of discharging their debt go free. It ends, as does every good thing on earth by overcoming itself. And this overcoming of justice one knows the beautiful name it has been given itself, which is mercy. So over time, eventually, justice overcomes itself, and um, out of justice is born a concept of mercy, which seems to be par paradoxically contradictory to justice, because in justice, when you commit a crime, you should be punished. That is, when you owe a debt, you should discharge that debt. But eventually, as society develops, it no longer becomes capable, it no longer becomes it's no longer, a th the individual is no longer a threat, and mercy comes out of this, which is justice uh, coming in back upon itself. Uh, okay, so number 11, this brings us to Nietzsche's concept of resentiment or resentment, right? And resentiment, if you recall from the first treatise, was Nietzsche, he thinks that's the, key, the linchpin which motivates a transition from the, from master morality towards slave morality, when he's thinking about he particularly points out Judeo-Christian history here. He thinks that this is really just revenge under the name of justice, right? And this is best seen today, he thinks, between the anarchists and the anti-Semites, right? And this is quite interesting, and here I was thinking as I was typing this about the current rise of American white nationalist um, anti-Semitism and, and also the, the rhetoric of the President of the United States, Donald Trump, because it seems to be that the American white nationalists and Donald Trump are precisely um, agreed in terms of their presentation of resentment, in terms of uh, a sort of resentment towards others who, uh, and so I think there's something interesting there to think about. I w I'm not going to go through all that, it's maybe not appropriate for this video, but I think there's something interesting there worth thinking about. So he, Nietzsche writes, the active, aggressive, arrogant man is still a hundred steps closer to justice than the reactive man, for he has absolutely no need to take a false and prejudiced view of the object before him in the way that the reactive man does and is bound to, right? So you have this sort of interesting distinction here where resentment is reactive, right? And so it's sort of interesting when I think of Donald Trump, he seems to have tapped into a political dimension of reaction. Reaction against you, reaction against the other, right? A white, the white nationalists appear to, to hold resentment towards anyone who's not white or I guess American or nationalist um, because ultimately they feel they've been slighted so it's reactive rather than being active and this is a sort of important distinction that's, that's worth maybe bearing out in future analyses but back to Nietzsche right so what Nietzsche says is that for this reason the aggressive man as the stronger the nobler the more courageous has in fact also at times a freer eye a better conscience on his side and conversely one who one can um, one can see who has the invention of the bad conscience on their side, that is, the man of resentment. So it's quite interesting here, um, when you think about this distinction that Nietzsche's trying to draw here, ultimately this is prefacing the distinction between the master and the slave, master morality and slave morality, good, bad, good, evil, right? So what this means is that where there is justice, it seeks to end the raging of resentment upon the, among the weaker powers that stand under it. And so the institutional of law is the decisive act of justice, right? Um, where resentment in, in, is organized, if you will, right? A law is instituted, personal evaluation gets replaced by an impersonal evaluation. Think here about how justice, uh, the statue of justice holds um, the scales of justice equally, impersonally, 
Think also of Kant's emphasis on the notion that to be moral agents, we have to think and rationalize or rationally evaluate our actions in an impersonal, objective manner. So, okay, back to the origin and purpose of punishment here, because punishment is the mechanism by which this repressive system is enabled for Nietzsche, right? And here Nietzsche says, don't confuse, we have to be careful that we don't confuse the purpose of law with the origin of law, right? So the purposes of the law and all the usefulness and the utilities of the law are only signs that a will to power is at work. But Nietzsche thinks that when we, when we inspect the origin um, of law, what we discover is nothing but the will to power. Um, whoops, let's see. Right. So there's sort of two aspects of punishment we can talk about. There's an enduring aspect, which is actually the act and the procedure itself. And there's the fluid aspect of a punishment, which is the meaning and the purpose of the punishment. What we see is that the punishment endures. It's the physical thing one does when they're punished, or the physical activity, the procedure. But why we do these punishments seems to change. So hence, it's fluid. And what ultimately Nietzsche says is that the latter, the, the meaning of our punishments, always gets interpreted and projected into the procedure. Um, so this sort of reveals um, that the procedure of the punishment wasn't invented to fit the purpose of the punishment, right? Um, so that means that the procedure of the punishment has a deeper origin, right? He says there's not one purpose or meaning, but a whole synthesis of meanings that develop over time that are embedded into the purposes of our punishment. And so what this seems to do is Nietzsche is revealing that there's a, a pattern, a patterning of punishment. And he, so he talks about, he says there's different patterns of punishment you can see, right? You can see punishments that are used to prevent harms, punishments as isolation of the disturbance, punishment as repayment, right? Punishment as the expulsion of a dangerous element, punishment as festival, making a mockery of the defeated, punishment as the making of memory, punishment as payment of a fee that's stipulated by power that protects the wrongdoer from the excess of revenge. There's also punishment of compromise as a compromise with revenge, and there's even punishment as a declaration of war or in response to war. So punishments have a whole synthesis, a whole confluence of, of elements that go into them. And so this means that there's a misunderstanding of punishment. Punishment's supposed to elicit phys um, phy uh, physically um, the feelings of guilt. I'm sorry, psychically the feelings of guilt, etc. Right? And what Nietzsche thinks is this is a total misunderstanding of psychology. Punishment generally concerns the feeling of isolation rather and spawns a feelings that rather than spawn feelings of guilt. For instance, when people are punished, they generally says what Nietzsche says they become um, condensed and their hatred and their anger grows, right? It usually doesn't, punishment doesn't usually make people feel bad. It just makes them mad, if you will, right? And he says in prehistory, punishment acted to hinder feelings of guilt. So guilt and the bad conscience do not, don't derive, in his view, from the act of punishing. They must derive from something else, right? And he has a reference to Spinoza, a well-known rationalist philosopher, who, who talked about the idea that the sting of the conscience didn't originate in God, but in the opposite of joy, in sadness. He says, uh, this is Nietzsche talking about Spinoza, that a sadness accompanied by the recollection of a past event that flouted all expectations, and that the sting of the conscience developed from suffering. It didn't develop here from God making us feel guilty, or, you know, in this sense. And Spinoza, who believes in God, right, and you can take a look at Spinoza's view on God's elsewhere, uh, but Spinoza has strong views on God, and, and many of Spinoza's commentators were confused and surprised that he wouldn't have said that the, the notion of guilt or that the bad conscience derives from God. But here, Spinoza seems to be in agreement with Nietzsche, and so Nietzsche's keen to point that out. And this means that he's developing here, Nietzsche, as a hypothesis for the origin of the bad conscience. Right? So you can say that civilization creates this new state of peace through legal means, right? Um, and this reduced human beings uh, to thinking, um, thinking beings. So human beings stripped away sort of their animality and began to operate according to rational principles. And this means that the psychology of the human being has led to an internalization of instinct. So the natural animalistic instinctual drives that human beings have because they're animals were slowly repressed um, and internalized uh, 
over time through these various processes, beginning with the punishment sort of, I'm sorry, beginning with the credit or debtor relationship into a legal punishment system, ultimately into a repression of the individual's own psychic instincts that results finally into the notion of a person as being, uh, having a sovereign free will, um, right, that's fully rational, basically Kant's view, right? All the instincts that don't discharge themselves outwardly turn inward, Nietzsche says. This is what he calls the internalization of man. Thus, it was that the first, uh, that the that man first developed what was later called the soul, right? So his notion is that the very idea that we have a soul is really just the internalization psychologically of our own instinctual drives onto themselves. And this, this culminates in the feeling of the bad conscience, right? Um, and so this is the moralization of the human animal. So hostility, cruelty, joy, and persecuting, and attacking, and change, and destruction, all this turned against the possessors of such instinct, such that this is precisely what the origin of the bad conscience is. And so the, the change towards guilt, right, was not gradual, but was sudden and violent. And after the change, the oldest civilizations appear violent themselves. And here he's getting at that point he articulated in the first treatise, that it's with the development of Christian theology, really with the, the, the advent of Jesus Christ uh, in his role historically, in, in that you suddenly see that the bad conscience is initiated and that the ancient Roman world is basically recognized as being evil and then it develops forward. So you can see Nietzsche's laying out the scaffolding for that argument in the first essay, and which will come in the next one too. Right, so the the change towards guilt didn't occur because of the old masters, but it happened. It, the change didn't occur because of the old masters, but it couldn't have happened without them, without this processes of punishment. So resulting mal or resentment is this key catalyzing force towards the development of the bad conscience. Right, he says the instinct for freedom forcibly latent. This instinct for freedom pushed back and repressed, incarcerated within and finally able to discharge and vent itself only on itself, that, and that alone, is what the bad conscience is in its beginnings, in its first stages. So what we see here is that, okay, this means that our moral values are ultimately egoistically based, right? He says that this hint will at least make less enigmatic the enigma, the question of how contradictory concepts such as selflessness, self-denial, self-sacrifice can suggest an ideal, a kind of beauty. And one thing we know henceforth is that, and he says that he has no doubt about it, and that is that the nature of the delight that the selfless man, the self-denier, the self-sacrificer feels from the first, this delight is tied to cruelty. So he thinks that ultimately when someone feels good because they've been selfless, Right, that is the preeminent internalization of these natural instincts, right? And this is tied to cruelty. So e even the selfless person is actually acting selfishly or out of self-interest or unconscious, instinctual, egoistic interest, right? So so much for the present, he says though, about the origin of the moral value as being unegoistic. So that means he says you can think of the bad conscience as like an illness, but he says it's an illness that's like pregnancy, which I kind of, I find frankly sort of um, uh, objectionable his characterization, uh, but think of it like this because he wants to say that the bad conscience is something that slowly develops like a, a newborn developing in the womb, right? So it's something, but then it results in this sudden violent pain and then suddenly you have this new being in the world, right? So this creditor-debtor relationship is one between that we have between ourselves and the present and our ancestors of, of former times, right? And, be, and this goes back eons, really, right? Or thousands of years. And because of the ancestors of the old tribal instinct, it, that's why the present exists. The cruelty of the ancient tribes is ultimately was a necessary condition for the development of the civilized world, right? And all, with all of its own moralization. So the present is actually in debt to these past ancestors. And over time, this debt only grows. But since the debt only grows, suspicion of the ancestors also grows. And here Nietzsche is suggesting that in ancient tribal worlds, uh, everyone in the tribe is indebted to their ancestors. But over the years, that, that indebtedness only grows and grows and grows, right? And it becomes very stifling eventually. So what Nietzsche suggests is that the primeval tribe eventually gives way 
to these nobler classes, which were able to overcome the debt, right? So now Nietzsche asks us to consider that the idea of the idea of what the consciousness of debt is when you talk about being in debt to a deity, right? So for instance, in Christianity, the view is, is that God becomes man and God, Jesus sacrifices himself uh, because of your guilt, your moral guilt and your spiritual guilt, your sin. And then from there, because of that sacrifice, you are relieved of that debt, right? So consider, so that means that you're in debt to this deity, right? And notice the way in which the ancients, the ancient tribal people would have also recognized themselves as being in debt to deities too, right? So you have this desire to be relieved of the debt. So what he thinks happens is that over the centuries with religious beliefs, you have layers and layers of psychological debt that are accumulating through centuries, right? Until you get to the development of monotheism in Christianity. And notice that there is a development, right? The most ancient religions appear polytheistic. They believe in multiple gods, which gods generally, at least in the Greek canon, they generally acted like human beings, right? Um, they had their own desires and all this stuff. Um, whereas in monotheism, we don't have that. We have a depersonalization of God, but God becomes um, absolute and monarchical, right? So the advent of the Christian God, Nietzsche claims, is um, as the maximum God attained so far, was therefore accompanied by the maximum feeling of guilty indebtedness on earth, right? So Christianity, uh, and Nietzsche notes that in the present world, as Christianity declines in terms of its influence, what we see is there's a decline in the feelings of guilt that people internalize, right? And here this seems to be true. Consider, for instance, if you want to go back historically and do an analysis and compare the psychological sense of guilt that people have regarding, um, for instance, sexual practices and the sort of psychological guilt people had about those same practices 100 years ago. And it does seem to be there's less guilt today. Um, so, but these things perhaps go back and forth. So there's not a clear... That's not necessarily true. One would have to ascertain that. Nietzsche says, Indeed, the prospect cannot be dismissed that the complete and the definitive victory of atheism might free mankind of this whole feeling of guilty indebtedness towards its origin, its causa prima. Atheism and a kind of, uh, and a kind of second innocence belong together. So Nietzsche thinks that maybe eventually there'll be a total complete decline of religious thinking and we'll just have atheism total victory in that sense there would be a complete change in the sense of guilt we would be a sort of second innocence which is sort of interesting um, right so but then Nietzsche says okay but this analysis still doesn't explain the moralization of the concepts of guilt and duty how do these things get moralized well what exactly is moralization we can think about moralization, and Nietzsche defines it as the pushing back of these concepts, guilt and duty, into cycle into the bad conscience, uh, right? So, um, so this is the process. It's this internal psychological internalization is this process of moralization. He says, but wait, of course, the the moralization of guilt and duty also involves the reverse direction of development, or at least to bring it to a halt, right? The aim now is to preclude the prospect of a final discharge, right? So he says it's sort of interesting here. You have this process of moralization that's internalizing guilt and duty, but if it goes too far, then you become a nihilist. There's no hope, right? And so at some point, there's a reversal, and that's you have to find some sort of final way to resolve this indebtedness. And he says that this this is really critical to the process of the moralization of the moral codes and beliefs of, um, let's say, the European world. Um, so the idea of guilt and duties turn inward towards the debtor, but then eventually onto the creditor as well. He says, quote, that stroke of genius on the part of Christianity, that God himself sacrifices himself for the guilt of mankind. God himself makes payment to himself. God is the only being who can redeem man from what has become unredeemable for man himself. That is, the creditor sacrifices himself for his debtor out of love. Out of love for his debtor, right? Sort of Nietzsche proclaims. So you can see here is that Nietzsche is sort of, he's, he's arguing here that what Christianity does is Christianity, since God is the ultimate, right, uh, creditor, God relieves, God doesn't get rid of the debt, 
but God allows a substitute for the dead, right? God allows himself as a substitute for the dead. So this is a sort of way in which you have a reversal where it's not just simply a more accumulations of inward indebtedness. There is a sort of uh, reflective move um, against that, right? And so, you so the moralization of guilt and duty is an act of the will that turns upon itself, right? Nietzsche says that man apprehends in God the ultimate antithesis of his own ineluctable animal instincts. He, man reinterprets these instincts as a form of guilt before God, right? And notice here that what we have here is that at the sort at the at the heart of this entire process is the the will to power, right? Because what we have here is that in this process of moralization, the will begins to think oneself punished without any possibility of the punishment ever equaling one's guilt. That is, no one can ever repay God. It's never possible, right? But it also doesn't result in punishment, right? It results in mercy, right? The will ultimately here serves to undermine itself, right? And its own egoistic instinctual desires and drives. And so what we see is that this culminates in the will erecting an ideal, uh, projecting out a new ideal that goes beyond this, right? And here, for instance, Nietzsche compares Christian God with the ancient Greek gods, right? So in Christianity, God's almighty, yet he's crucified, right? And you also have at the heart of Christianity this concept of sin, now compared to the Greek gods, right? The Greek gods are sort of fulfill the aristocratic ideals, and also the the, the Greek gods have their own purposes. They're in conflict with each other. They seem all too human, right? Right, Nietzsche says, quote, concerning the Greek gods, in whom the animal and man felt deified and did not lacerate himself, did not rage against itself. So in the Greek gods, the animal instincts are actually deified. In the Christian god, they're nullified. And here, for instance, whereas in Christianity, you have a concept of sin, in the ancient Greek religions, you have a concept of foolishness. The person's a fool, whereas the foolishness is an inability of the will to power to will correctly. This isn't the same as this spiritual notion of sin, endless guilt before God. So, it, so we can ask this question, well, is Nietzsche trying to erect some new ideal here or just knock down these old views? And Nietzsche here suggests, whoops, uh, Nietzsche, uh, that was annoying. Uh, Nietzsche suggests that um, if a temple is to be erected, a temple has to be destroyed. So he's sort of doing both, right? But you can ask then again, but can such a I new ideal be attained in the present age? And here Nietzsche suggests that, at least in his own day and age, or the late 19th century, it doesn't look like it can, at least not yet. He says that in order to attain this new ideal, it would require something of a different spirit. And here Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche basically foreshadows his conception of the ubermensch or the overman, quote, this man of the future who will redeem us, not only from the hitherto re reigning ideal, but also that which was bound to grow out of it, the great nausea, the will to nothingness, nihilism, this bell stroke of noon and of the great decision that liberates the will again and restores its goal to the earth and his hope to man, this antichrist, the anti-nihilist, this victor over God and nothingness, he must come one day. So here Nietzsche is sort of suggesting that there may be a new ideal, a total overcoming of this moral internalization, something that is, that is very different, a sort of new emergent possibility. And Nietzsche suggests eventually it will come. But then in the very last section, Nietzsche says, enough, enough, I've gone off track. Right. And so with this enough enough, we'll go ahead and end our video today. You'll see in the next video series, we'll take up Nietzsche's third treatise, uh, third essay, which is on the question of what is the meaning of ascetic ideals? And we'll see Nietzsche articulate uh, his genealogy of morality in an even fuller and more colorful way. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I appreciate it. And I'll see you guys online next time. Okay, bye.